welcome everyone for this uh, uh, conversation uh, presentation as well. I will be talking about the PhD program in general uh, as um, what are the typical myths and what is the reality in STEM disciplines. And then I will give an overview of what is the PhD in the School of Engineering and Digital Sciences at Nazarbayev University. My name is Luis Rojas Solorzano. I'm the director of the graduate programs in the School of Engineering and Digital Sciences. First, let's define what is a myth. A myth is some, something that most people believe, but uh, it's not necessarily true. And uh, what are the most popular myths in uh, studying PhD in STEM disciplines? Well, those myths are basically related to several aspects that I will list as prior aptitudes, uh, meaning what skills and mindset you need to have prior to the PhD program. What is about the regime, uh, about the duration, and what is the dedication a typically, uh, typically a PhD student must have in the program. And the other area of myth is financial support. How will be my financial support during my PhD studies? And the expectations during the program and after the program. So uh, these are typically the areas where people have most of the uh, myth. I will be talking about uh, first, what are the typical myths regarding prior aptitudes? And uh, first is we need to have experience before doing the PhD. That's what most people believe. Second, people believe that before doing the PhD, they must know everything about the field of the PhD they want to embrace. Also, some people believe that to do a PhD, you have to be a genius. And uh, also, many people believe that they are too old already, or they are over-experienced to embrace into a PhD. Regarding the regime, most of the myths that people have about doing a PhD in STEM disciplines are that a PhD is just an extension of the master's three, four more years doing as we did in the master program, student life, similar. Some people also believe that is about just working in business hours or just having someone to tell you, do this, do that, and follow instructions. Also, some people believe, no, this is a slavery. We have to work 24 by seven during the four years of the program to get a PhD. Regarding the financial support part, let's see what are the typical myths that people have in PhD studies for STEM disciplines. People believe that, oh, I will be starving during my PhD. I don't have enough funding to live. Also, some people believe that uh, they have to pay themselves for field trips to collect data for their work, the research. And also they have to pay the conference they have to attend during the PhD. And finally, they have to pay by themselves for the consumables. That's what people believe most of the times about the financial support. What about the expectation? What is the typical, what are the typical beliefs of uh, people regarding the expectations during and after the PhD? Some people believe that they will be assigned a, P, a supervisory committee that they have nothing to say about it and they will not have any word to say about the research topic they have to follow. Some people believe also that um, once you start your research in the PhD, you have a hypothesis. You have a hypothesis that if that hypothesis proves to be false, you will be a failure in a science also, some people believe that you will not publish any paper until you get your PhD. So you have to wait until the end of the program 
to start publishing papers and becoming notorious in the field of science. And also people believe, or some people believe that the PhD is only for uh, the academia to teach, to continue working as a teacher, as a professor in the university. And some other people believe that if they do a PhD, they will be overqualified for any professional job in the industry. Before I tell you what is the reality behind all these myths, I want to introduce you what is the School of Engineering and Digital Sciences and what are the typical programs, what are the programs we have in the PhD area. And then after that, I will tell you what is the reality of all these myths in our PhD programs. First, the School of Engineering and Digital Science is one of the school of Nazarbayev University, and it has undergrads and graduate students. In the graduate students area, we have masters and PhDs, and uh, the structure of the school is uh, shown in this, in this uh, slide. We have the dean of the school, and we have vice dean of academic affairs and vice dean of research. And underneath, we have the head of the departments. We have six departments in the School of Engineering and Digital Sciences. And we have also at the, under the deans, vice deans, the directors of the undergrad and graduate programs. All together, they build what is called the school board or executive board of the school. And on top of, the, uh, under, under this uh, school board, we have the different committees of the school, teaching and learning, research committee, travel committee, et cetera, et cetera. And the, re and the respective graduate committees in each one of the departments. Then what are the doctoral programs we are offering in our school? Well, we have the PhD in science, engineering and technology, which is the older program in our school. It's a wrong program between the School of Engineering and Digital Sciences and the School of, of uh, Science and Humanities. And uh, then we have this, this PhD in chemical engineering, PhD in civil engineering, PhD in electrical engineering, PhD in mechanical engineering, PhD in robotics engineering, and PhD in computer science. On the right hand side, you can see what is the department that holds each one of these department based programs. What is the typical structure of this program? They are based on 240 ECTS, which are the European credits. And uh, each ECTS represents approximately 25 to 30 hours of dedication of work. That is a relative number, okay? And uh, typically the PhD is expected to be completed in four years, but might take up to five or in some except, exceptional cases, six years. And it has two years of courses, the first two semesters, uh, one year of courses, sorry, two semesters of courses. And then after that, we have three more years fully dedicated to research. In these first two semesters, the students are expected to take four core courses and six elective courses. And those courses are listed, the core courses are listed on the right, on the middle of this slide. And during the first year, the student will be passing courses with uh, letter grades, and the student must maintain a CGPA of B minus or higher to be in the program. Having less than B minus means that the students enter in probation. But I would say if you work, you put dedication, you should be able to keep B minus or higher in the program. In the end of the first year, the student has what we call the subject or comprehensive qualifying exam, which is in the end of the first year, you have an exam that will evaluate your knowledge on different sub areas of your discipline. Then the student at the end of the first year must identify the supervisory committee and the research topic that 
he or she will follow in their thesis. The thesis proposal defense, also called research qualifying examination, will happen in the end of the third semester, so in the middle of the second year, after passing the subject or comprehensive exam qualification. And the thesis has to be defended at the end of the program and should be expected to happen in the last semester. And the student must submit a book and have an oral defense of the thesis. What does the School of Engineering and Digital Sciences offers to students in our programs? We offer excellence in education with a faculty made uh, with more than 70% of the international recognized faculty and uh, national also very recognized faculty among the six departments. We have a very, support, very supportive administrative and technical staff in our laboratories and the administration of the programs. We have top-notch laboratories and high-power uh, computing uh, development equipment for doing the research. We have a state-of-the-art library that you can count during the whole program. With And uh, we have also students who are participating from abroad. We are open and we are welcoming international students. And we are growing on the number of international students every year. And we have international collaboration with many universities around the world. About the dissemination of research, we offer uh, the opportunity to students to participate in international conferences, in high impact publications, and having also opportunities as entrepreneur, uh, future entrepreneurs. In the university also offer the opportunity to collaborate with local events, services to industry, et cetera. What do we expect from our students? Well, we expect students to have the NU graduate attributes that we have stamped for all our graduate students. And this essentially is summarized in the next eight lines. Uh, we need or we expect students to have a depth or deep and sophisticated understanding of the field of knowledge by the end of the program. We expect to have students who are, who are curious, creative, open-minded to new ideas. We expect to have a thoughtful decision makers that will be capable to involve other people in future decisions. And we also expect that some of our PhD students at the end of the program, they will become entrepreneurs, which uh, will be able to self-propel and create new opportunities for other people as well. We expect to have also good communicators among our PhD students. We want to have, or we expect to have also students who are tolerant and multicultural in terms of uh, allowing participation and collaboration with citizens of all around the world. We expect, this is very important, high integrity from our students and graduates. And we expect to form the future leaders in different disciplines that will guide the country toward the major uh, goals of Kazakhstan 2050 to become one of the top 30 country economies in the world by 2050. So now I will present what are the reality behind the myth that I introduced initially based on our PhD program in the School of Engineering and Digital Science. I will present in the left-hand side what was the myth and what is the reality. So regarding prior aptitude, we said that we need to have work experience. Well, the reality is that work experience is valuable, but it's not compulsory. So you can continue after your master's into the PhD if you have vocation, if you feel you are inclined to research and you can just be successful as well. Then I need to know all about my field. That was the myth. Well, the reality is that 
most of the knowledge or deep knowledge that you will have about the field is going to be built throughout the program. The myth about being a genius, of course, being a genius is an, is an advantage, but this is not necessarily what you need to be to become a successful PhD student and PhD at the end of the program. It's more important or is as important, I would say, to be curious, critical thinker, disciplined, and hardworking person to become successful. For those who think that you are too old because you are already about 30 or maybe near 40, or you are over experienced because you've been in industry for more than 10 years, well, the reality is that passion, energy, discipline, love for what you will do is ageless, doesn't have an age. Okay? So you can be successful at any age with the PhD as far as you have the passion to work in research and learn new, new things, okay? New areas of knowledge. Okay, regarding the regime, regarding the regime, the first myth is about the PhD just three more years or four more years of studies like I did in my master's or my undergrad. The reality is, is not that. The reality is that the PhD is about growing as a scientific uh, person. And therefore, it's uh, more about growing in science than just being uh, following a pencil of studies of courses. What about uh, the myth about working rigidly, rigidly in office hours or just following instructions of someone telling you what to do until the end? Not so, no, because the piece is about demonstrating in the end that you are capable to do work independently. So you have to demonstrate at the end of the PhD that you can be an independent researcher and you can be an independent scientist that can help other people to grow as well. But what about the myth about I need to work 24 by seven, it's a slavery work? Well, the PhD is not about hours of work, it's about achievements. So the, the achievements you will be uh, overcoming are the important steps to follow, more than the number of hours you work. What about financial support? Well, regarding the myth of I will be starving with my stipend, uh, or I will have to fund myself for field trips. Well, NU in the School of Engineering and Digital Sciences offers graduate teaching assistants positions, which are mandatory during at least two semesters in the program. And also you have the opportunity to participate as research assistants in the projects of your supervisors. These two are sources of funding that will complement your stipend to a very competitive income during the PC studies. Also, what about I need to fund myself, my conference trips or my consumables? Well, the program in the School of Engineering and Digital Sciences offers you a budget until the end of a program for the fourth year, for the four years of the program a budget per every, every year to support your expenses in consumables, conferences, and publications. What about expectations? Well, the myth that I have no word in choosing who will be my supervisor and what will be my thesis research, that's not the way it works. In our school, we have the student and supervisors agreement in what the student will be doing as his or her future research and who will be the supervisory committee members. So you will have a word to say on that. What about the hypothesis when you start a research in a science, one of the steps is writing hypothesis, which is an educated guess of what you expect to happen. And the educated guess might be true or false, as any hypothesis. So if the hypothesis happens to be false, but you do a rigorous research, well, having a false hypothesis doesn't mean you are a failure at all. 
on the opposite side, it might be a knowledge that was created with this uh, hypothesis test. So it's not a failure at all. A hypothesis can be true or false. And if you follow a rigorous uh, steps in the scientific method, all results are very important in science. Finally, about expectation, I will only publish papers when I finish my PhD. No, not really. You will be publishing from the second year on, if you wish, and that is encouraged by your program. And by the end of a PhD, in order to get your diploma, we require that you have at least, at least one Q1 journal paper based on your research with your name as a lead author, proving that you are capable to do the leadership or to lead the publication of the paper. About the working in the academia only as the only option for PhDs, or I will be overqualified to work in the industry. Let me tell you that a large number of PhD uh, professionals, they work in the industry. Indeed, in STEM disciplines, more than 50% of uh, graduates from MIT in the US, they work in the industry in research and development. And this is growing every day because the PhD program is a training program to uh, let your critical thinking develop skills and become a person that can have skills to do investigation in different areas. And this is important for industry as well, to develop new products, new technologies. With that, I welcome to our program and I'm now open to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear professor. Dear participants, you are welcome to ask the questions about the study process, about the admission process. You can, uh, you can write your question in the chat box or ask it by turning on your microphone. Okay, feel free to ask any question, okay? I think we have a question. The chat box. Okay, let's see. Here the question from uh, one of the uh, uh, people in the audience. Is there a chance to live and work in Almaty during the study? Well, the answer is not easy. I mean, at this moment with the pandemics, uh, I would say you could have done that during the past year, but during the regular program that we expect to continue happening after this uh, uh, summer, I think, no, you have to be in Astana, in Nur Sultan, to develop most of your work because you need to interact in the laboratory or in the computer facilities. And I would say uh, in the first year, that's not possible because you need to have classes which are going to be in classrooms. And uh, I think that's what we are expecting after summer that we can come back to the classrooms. And if you have a thesis topic that is going to be experimental, for example, you need to use the laboratory facilities and you need to be uh, quite involved in that. So it's a full-time uh, dedication and full-time dedication. Uh, if you need the resources that we offer in the campus, then you need to be in the Sultan necessarily. I will say that in the second year and ahead, if your work is based on um, simulations and you will use a computer uh, support, you might be intermittently going from Almaty to Nur Sultan and uh, maybe you can have a meeting with video conference with your supervisors. But I recommend strongly to have person-to-person -person meeting with supervisor regularly. This is very important. This is a work that had to happen throughout the, the program. Even though you will become an independent researcher during the first three, four years or the four years of the program, 
you need to have a good communication with your supervisor. And uh, we expect this to happen in North Sudan. Any other questions? Well, I think this question had one also part that says, I'm working on Mati. Uh, when you say work, I imagine you say work in the thesis, not work in a company, because this is a full-time program, okay? We are expecting you to fully dedicate to the program. You cannot be working in a company and doing the PhD. That's not accepted in the program. In the new uh, PhD per discipline, this is a condition. Okay, if I have a master's degree in electrical engineering, can I get a PhD specialized in data science, a research project in implementing data analysis techniques for power systems? Yes, you can. You just need to convince the admission committee in the PhD in computer science, that uh, which is the, I think the field where you are applying, I imagine. You need to convince them that you are motivated and you have enough background to embrace for the PhD in computer science. And as, as you know, uh, if you are going to do the, the data analysis on power systems, you have the background in power systems as electrical engineering. So the computer science background, you can acquire, acquire it during the first year of the program, at least a theoretical one. Any other question? Okay, you're welcome. So again, uh, we have PhDs in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, computer science, robotics engineering, and mechanical engineering. So you might have a different background, but uh, as far as you have uh, enough uh, compatibility with the program and you present a good motivation letter explaining why you want to pursue that specific program and you have a, a good uh, background in your previous studies on good GPA, uh, good performance, if you have papers publication, it's a plus in the program for being admitted. Uh, it's not mandatory, but it's a plus. Well, you can apply, of course, for, for one of these disciplines. Okay, another question I, I have here is, uh, hi, uh, sir, when, when your department will start PhD biomedical engineering in the future? Uh, well, uh, not it's not in our plans, uh, but biomedical engineering, as you know, can be, uh, derived or can be uh, also within the PhD in mechanical engineering or the PhD in electrical engineering, depending on how you uh, orientate your work. So we have the possibility of working with a project in which your supervisor is a professor from the Department of Mechanical Engineering and your co-supervisor is a professor from, for example, biology or from another department so you might have, you can have this, this uh, component, but the diploma that we are going to offer is only on the disciplines I mentioned. And, um, and, and therefore the thesis work will define in which sub area you will be working. So you will be working in biomedical engineering, but your diploma will be in mechanical engineering or in electrical engineering or in chemical engineering, depending on the department where you base your work but you need to have an advisor that belongs to that department. And you might have a co-supervisor from other department that complements your work. I hope I answered the question, okay? But feel free to re-ask me if you feel the question was not fully answered, okay, please. Okay, any other question? Uh-huh, uh, uh, okay, 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome, Mohammed. Any other question? And dear participants, uh, hello, uh, my name is Aida. I'm a senior manager for admission and recruitment issues. Hi, Professor. Hi, Aida. Uh, so, uh, dear participants, if you have any questions about admission requirements, also please, you are welcome. Uh, just, I can uh, here shortly summarize about admission requirements. So first of all, we need from you um, uh, your uh, IELTS certificate, it's 6.5, uh, the minimum, it's minimum, uh, and the six from uh, each uh, sub-parts uh, sub of IELTS. Uh, also, we need your master degree diploma. Uh, the the um, GPA is 2.75. Uh, and uh, uh, all other, uh, your passports uh, and the other uh, some, maybe uh, some special papers if you change your for example your surname so some uh, and the two recommend uh, recommendation letter mm, and the, your motivation letter cv this kind of documents should be submitted to your online account uh, in admission portal so all this uh, list of documents all this information uh, is available in our admission website so you can go to our in u.edu.kz website and there is the admission part so everything is there also announcements every time is uh, updating there so please uh, follow up and um, uh, next um, next day like uh, february march we are going to provide uh, our open house days virtual by departments so also you can participate there to ask your questions directly to head of departments, to professors. So you are welcome. Uh, if you have any other questions, please uh, write to our emails. Uh, Lunar will provide you our email for admission requirements. And also, uh, professor provided here his email. Please write, ask any questions. We are happy to answer you. And we wish you good luck uh, and uh, take care, please. And you are welcome to Kazakhstan, to Nur Sultan, uh, to our school. Uh, yeah, so. Thank you. Any Aida. other questions? Mm -hmm. I we have a question. One. Yes, we have a question in chat box. Yeah. Yes, I have a, a question. And I want also to make, uh, since the audience is not asking many questions at this moment, I have. I will also do some game with Aida. I will ask questions, Aida, as I, if I were a student. Some questions that mm -hmm. I know they will probably be interested in answering. But let me first answer the question from the uh, Aituhan, Aituhan uh, which is asking, uh, what if I take a topic which is interdisciplinary, for example, GSPP and SETS, any limitation regarding the selection of the topic? Yes, let me explain you. There is no limitation as far as the topic is offered by one of the faculty of the department of your program. So let's say you pick the PhD in civil engineering so the faculty in that department, they will have different topics to offer, and then you will have to match with one of them. So if you can convince one of the faculties of the department to embrace in a separate topic that works with a GSPP, for example, this is fine, as far as there is an involvement of the faculty of the civil or the department where you are going to do the PhD. But you must work with a supervisor, lead supervisor, which is from that department, and that person must be a qualified person in that field. So that's why the topic can be interdisciplinary as far as the supervisor and you agree on that. I think Lunara is asking, uh, I, you are putting some comments, Lunara, okay, about this. Okay, I will ask a question. Uh, you're welcome, Aitugan. I will ask a question to Aida as if I were a student. Uh, well, Aida, if I am a master student from a Salvador student university and I'm getting my master's this year, what happens when I apply? I don't have the master's diploma. What happens in that case when I am applying? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you are our student, Nazarbayev University student, so you can just um, 
uh, require your official transcript from our office of the registrar and submit permanently your transcript, but you will uh, write like a statement that you will provide your uh, original of your uh, diploma uh, uh, till the, uh, the fixed time. The admission will give you the deadline and until this time, you should provide us your diploma. But for the application time, you can submit your official transcript. This is the requirement for final year students. Okay. Also, uh, for our Nazarbayev University uh, students, uh, you do not need to submit um, IELTS or TOEFL because your um, study was 100% in English. So this is the proof. And, uh, you, will, you don't need to submit IELTS and the TOEFL. Okay, great, Aida. And I have now some uh, uh, maybe uh, hints for those who are connected now about application for the PhD programs. When we evaluate the applications, we evaluate all the requirements that my colleague Aida presented. And then if you pass this filter, you enter into the mm -hmm. admission committee as a potential uh, candidates to the program, and we have to evaluate your applications. What is a strong application is, or uh, are those that have a good motivation letter, uh, they have a good uh, background connected to the field where they are applying, and also they have, if they have publications, if you have publications, don't forget to mention the publication in your application because this is very important for the admission committee when they consider your your uh, your uh, documents, the admission committee will check uh, if you have any publication from your previous thesis or previous uh, work. That's very important. Besides your professional background, also and experience, highlight that very clearly. And all these are aspects that are very important for the next stage after you have all the minimum requirements to apply. I don't know if anybody else wants. Ah, somebody's asking a question. I have read from the website that IELTS can be waived if the degree was received in a country with English as an official language. What with GRE? Do I need to take if again if GRE was taken for master? Uh, as as far as I uh, as I know, we don't need GRE. It's not mandatory. It's recommended, but it's not mandatory for admission. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is optional variant. So, uh, GRE, G, G, GMAT is not a uh, like, a, it's not compulsory. This is just an optional variant. So, if yes. you have these certificates and the, you have their good results, just uh, in that way, please submit. But uh, if you have their bad results, please do not submit it. <laughs> this is yeah. like a life hack from us. <laughs> yeah, then, uh, yeah, about IELTS, yeah. If you studied before, your before degree was 100% uh, in English, uh, the language of instruction was English. So you should uh, submit a special paper where it's written that you studied in English 100%. So you will be exempted from the submitting of IELTS and TOEFL. So mm -hmm. this is, yeah, it, we, it, it is written on our website in all our requirements. So th that's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other mm -hmm. question? Uh, the participant also, please uh, let me in, um, like uh, to tell you about uh, the admission process just shortly. So first of, all, first of all, you should create your uh, admission account in our portal online. Uh, then you should submit all, upload all your certificates, documents, transcripts, everything, and click uh, the button submit. Please do not forget to click this submit. Then after your submission, your documents will be reviewed first of all by department of admi admission department. This is a general department for all university. Then if your documents meet all the requirements, they're right, they're correct, uh, then your documents will be transferred to school uh, where uh, the admission special admission committee will review your documents. Mm -hmm. After reviewing uh, this, uh, all your documents, you if everything is okay there, so you uh, it will be shortlisted. Then uh, by the secretary of admission committee, you will be invited to the interview. Interview uh, will be online because of this quarantine situation by Skype or by Zoom maybe. 
Uh, then after the interview, in like two weeks, maybe uh, one or two weeks, uh, you will be informed by email uh, about admission or waiting list you are or rejection. So this kind of information will come to your email. So please check your email uh, frequently. Uh, and uh, you can check also your status in, the, in your cabinet, in your account. Uh, so this is the like process. Mm -hmm. uh, Aida, someone is asking a question uh, about the research. Can I discuss my research with yeah. supervisor? Uh, uh -huh. Yes, of course. You can you can discuss and you can you are encouraged to check what are the faculty uh, what are the faculty in a given department doing in research so you have an idea because once you uh, start the PhD in one discipline your lead supervisor must be from that discipline and he or she will mostly offer projects so you will pick one of those projects in some cases you might convince the faculty to work in the project that you want to develop your your research but most of the cases the faculty already have have has its own or her own projects and therefore you you will be uh, encouraged to check and to have a conversation with faculties and formally speaking and this is very important also formally speaking you don't need to have a supervisor until the end of the first year so you will have mm -hmm. the first year to explore among the different uh, faculties uh, available but it's I think it's also always good to have an idea beforehand. What will you find in that department? And there's another question. Are supervisors authorized to do that even if the person is not a new student yet? Of course, we are open university. We are uh, fully uh, open and welcoming questions. So I think all, all of us, we are really happy to receive questions from prospect students. So we can see also the potential of the prospect students. And in some cases, uh, you know, that could be a good presentation letter for you. Because if you have a faculty that is already interested in working with you, uh, that might be also a source of a recommendation letter that can help you in the process or can be also uh, a person that can be very interested in helping, uh, uh, in some uh, advising you to, to apply in a way that you can have more chances of succeed. Mm -hmm. I think some other question, is it possible to take an internship at your university, as CM is asking? Um, I don't know internship in what terms. Are, are you a master that wants to do array work? Is that what you say, as CM? You have a master degree already? Well, assuming that as CM, uh, uh, she says he, she's asking if she can make an internship as a P, uh, she's a PhD. Okay, so you are you are thinking about a postdoc in that case. If you are already a PhD, you are thinking about doing a postdoc. Uh, a postdoc is a research position, and the university, as you might know, we are a strongly a research oriented university, and we many of our faculty have uh, postdocs working with them in their projects that are funded. So it's like a work. So you have a salary but you have to dedicate the time in the research. And yes, there are opportunities. I invite you to, con to connect with the research um, office of our school and check with them for vacancies, uh, vacancies in the postdocs. So you can apply and then you hopefully can get the position if you, if you fit the requirements. Any other question? Also, the participants, uh, if you need any information about our faculty, so in our website, there is a special part where uh, all the information uh, provided by about our professors. Lunara, could you just send us a link here to participants, uh, faculty mm -hmm. from our website? Yeah, so it will be easy to them. Okay. Uh, as I think Aida and Lunara said, we are welcoming also international students. So those of you who are from abroad, our university is interested in talents uh, from Kazakhstan and from abroad who are motivated to do uh, their PhD with us. So we are uh, opening uh, to the doors to good students from everywhere around the world. 
Yes. Okay, I think uh, this is the link that my colleague Aida mentioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, uh, you have our emails, you have the links, and I really hope to have many applicants in our next call, our next batch, and hopefully to welcome you to our program soon. So the participants, thank you very much uh, for your uh, uh, participation in our today's webinar. So uh, the record of this uh, webinar will be uh, published in our YouTube channel. So thank you very much to our professor uh, for this wonderful presentation. Very useful, I, I guess it was. So uh, take care. Uh, thank you very much. See you in our next webinars. So thank bye. You. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.